Good afternoon. My name's Mick Napier and I'm delivering another of our pretty regular uh, Sunday afternoon live interview broadcasts where we interview people who we think have something very significant to add to the discussion over effective solidarity with the beleaguered people of Palestine. Last week we had uh, Haifa Zangana speaking to us from uh, Tunisia and this week we have Jim Malone speaking to us from exotic Dundee, <laughs> uh, not too far from where I am as well. Jim Malone, a big welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Mick, and it's great to be speaking to you, and a happy new year. Hi, I see you. It's going to be a hard new year with this new government. Jim has been a Fire Brigade's member, Fire Brigade Union member, for 37 years. So he knows his way around the state union movement. For 10 or almost 11 of those years, he's been actively involved in developing bonds and links of support and solidarity with firefighters in Palestine. Many of you will have been to Palestine. Many of you, many more will know a fair bit about what's going on there. But the story of firefighters in the West Bank trying to do the job of saving lives under, under a military occupation is a story which I have to say when I heard firefighters speak, Palestinian firefighters speak in Glasgow a couple of years ago, I was genuinely shocked. And I've been there about 19 times and saw the horror from lots of different angles. Jim, um, the FBU in many ways are a gold standard. You've been building solidarity with firefighters. You've been going there. Um, tell viewers a little bit about this image behind me, it's an yeah. Israeli soldier and some firefighters. Yeah, this is what's this, happening and what ah, can happen to firefighters there. It's a very uh, common daily occurrence where firefighters uh, are asked to attend incidents, both in the occupied West Bank and, and the areas around the Gaza Strip and in uh, Israel itself. Now, you, you mentioned the viewers who have traveled uh, before uh, to Palestine, they'll know the checkpoints that are placed. The regular checkpoints are ones that the, the work around with the Israeli authorities that actually have arrangements to go through the regular checkpoints. It's where uh, there are irregular checkpoints are placed and you will have Israeli occupying forces denying them entry uh, to an area where they've been asked to attend emergency incidents. So what we have in the background is uh, an Israeli uh, occupation force, force soldier, a squaddy, no doubt. Uh, and alongside him is a woman I know well, uh, Anna Tara, uh, educated at Dundee University. Anna was well, the There's last another time. Dundee connection. What yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. We'll talk uh, about sure. Dundee later in some okay. depth. Yeah, so these firefighters are asking permission to attend an incident. And uh, an Israeli soldier there is probably relaying the word from his superior to say, you're not going any place. You're waiting here until we tell you you're allowed to go. And that is Let's what Let's be clear, happens. Jim. Let's be clear. They could be going to, in a life-saving capacity, to a, road, a terrible road traffic accident or a fire, and they are now being impeded by Israeli occupation soldiers who know full well where they're going, yeah? You know... Mick, it's timely uh, you've shown this photograph, but, and it brings back to, to mind that this year past, 2019, another year of horrors uh, uh, inflicted and visited on ordinary Palestinians expecting an emergency response team to attend a fire. Uh, earlier this year in the besieged city of uh, uh, Hebron, uh, firefighters were denied entry for a period to an incident in which three young children died. I missed that, that a period of how long, Jim? Can you repeat that? Uh, uh, they were held at this, but, to upwards to an hour. An hour? An hour. Now, a firefighter knows that a minute is, you know, that's the difference between a life and, and a life lost. But unfortunately, not one life is lost this time. There was three young children lost for the one family. And it happened at a time of the Labour Party were in, in Dundee at a Scottish conference. And uh, we raised that, of course, and a motion was passed and sent, obviously, by similar methods as we are interviewing today, uh, to the people in Hebron as an act to solidarity. But the year previous, when I was in the Scottish Parliament, 
Uh, so Jim, do you want me to interrupt? You've got a meeting in Dundee, it's a Labour Party conference yeah. taking place, you're a delegate, and you brought in the voices of Palestinians such as Absolutely. these by technical Absolutely. means, yeah? Absolutely, but what we did was uh, we hosted a meeting with the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, uh, who attended, he, he wasn't the guest, the guest was the new ambassador, uh, Mr Hussam Zomlo, and he was coming to show solidarity with the people that are involved in the twinning. And the it's SPU, not unusual for major politicians to attend any meeting unless they yeah. are the focus of attention. No, no, no. Th those that were at the meeting will tell you. Jeremy made was actually out at, again a, a beleaguered workforce at Michelin visiting the plant, and he came uh, uh, from there to the the Queen's Hotel in Dundee to meet with members of, uh, of the movement, of the trade union movement, and members of the D Dundee Nablus Twinning Association. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Mike. Uh, we also had uh, various uh, invited uh, people, people of note in the city, and Jeremy yeah. came along. But the, the main issue we raised that day was the death of these three young children and the fact that these children had died quite simply because they had, the firefighters were denied entry to the house that was on fire by Israeli... So it was a domestic fire of the kind yeah. that you get here. Yeah. And if firefighters can get there on time, lives can be yeah. saved if they're impeded there's a great chance that lives will be it was in danger. And, as I say, these three young children, uh, aged between four and, and one, uh, died. Uh, and I, I was just about to say, the year previously, we were given a, a, a with visiting firefighters who you met, Mick, uh, from Hebron. Uh, and we went to the Scottish uh, Parliament, invited by the cross-party group, uh, by Sheila White and others. And we attended a meeting that, and all members of parliament are allowed to attend that meeting. And uh, there was members of the Conservative Party there. The current Scottish leader was there. But I knew they were there and I made the point because it had been raised about another incident where firefighters had been denied entry. And I actually asked them there, knowing who they were there representing. Mm. And I said to them, can you assist us and make it plain to your contacts within the Israeli government? that these incidents don't happen. So that was a year before, almost a year before, these devastating losses in Hebron, these three young children dying through no fault of their own, other than the fact that the Israeli occupiers denied the firefighters from Hebron, who were trained in Scotland. We trained these firefighters, and we trained them to go and do the humanitarian work firefighters throughout the world do, and they were denied entry by the Israeli occupation forces, and these three kids died. And I asked the leader of the Conservative Party, who is now in Scotland, I asked him to assist, and you know what he did? Well, you know what he did. Nothing. Jim, there's a parallel here. You're bringing these guys over here in acts of solidarity and comradeship. You're training together on how to get to a fire, uh, how to save minutes or even seconds in order to make a difference. Um, it's an up, and, and then this happened. Well, your training is rendered null and void in terms of helping people. I've just, I'm just looking at um, examples of the Dutch government and other EU governments donating solar panels. In one mm. occasion, the Dutch donating classrooms, mobile, cl mm. you know, cl yeah. prefab classrooms, yeah. which yeah. are then broken up or smashed up or even confiscated and sold by the Israeli authorities. Have we not seen a pattern mm. here of massive efforts to help from around the world? and massive efforts to nullify those other efforts from outside. The, 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 and they do it with complete impunity to the government or government organizations who are trying to help. Uh, all of the work that we did post-2012, uh, Mick, was done in cooperation and collaboration with the United States Support Command based in Ramallah, of which the British government were also attached. Now that United States Support Command were there to facilitate assistance to the Palestinian Authority, not the municipalities, but the Palestinian Authority, including the Palestinian Authority firefighters. Now these firefighters do the same job as the municipality, but they do it in a larger context in the sense that they are uh, uh, called up in, in a fact that they're like what we would used to have in, uh, after uh, the, the Second World War, national service, a sort of national service. So they, they apply to join, it isn't a call up, but they, at once they are in, they could be placed in the fire service 
or the police or the presidential guard within the Palestinian Authority. So we did work through official sources and the United States Support Command ploughed millions and millions of dollars into the Palestinian Authority to try and set up a fire service that was uh, organized within the areas governed by the Palestinian Authority, the local police, John Durham, and also the presidential guard, which were, were obviously only allowed to, to train with, with small arms and, and, and the like. But that setup was based in, in, the, the, in the West Bank in Jericho. And the British involvement, including the Fire Brigade Union to a degree, as we assisted them by giving them advice on what would be best placed, looking at our own efforts at the, the fire service training schools previously at Gullen and then uh, at the new outstanding facility in Cambus. Gullen's a fire training. It company. was. Uh, it's, now the, uh, it's now at Cambus Lang. Okay. Uh, and that is a, a world class facility that has, that has obviously now trained many, many teams of Palestinian firefighters. So, we based the support and assistance that we offered to those in Jericho on what we knew our world-class fire service here in Scotland could provide. Now, once the, 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 the aid was, the, it was, it was cut by this Trump administration, it didn't make things that much worse because already with the previous administrations, the Israelis denied the kit and equipment that the US government provided. They would uh, impound it at ports and airports and keep it there for months and years on end to deny the Palestinian fire and rescue services being able to afford the use of it. So we just became, our, our originality was we decided to, to cut through uh, when working with the municipalities, we cut out all the official contacts. We did it to a degree quite freelance by going directly to organizations and saying we can do this. And while keeping the, the foreign Commonwealth office on side by giving them briefing notes, that is all we did. We decided not to go through the United States Support Command for kit and equipment. Uh, however, use them as an ally when it meant us struggling to get kit and equipment and using their pressure through diplomatic sources. But uh, they, they, the Israeli authorities have denied uh, American aid on numerous occasions. Yeah, no, no, that's um, that just adds to the bizarre nature of the relationship between efforts lower down the American political tree to help and the yeah. way they are thwarted by the Israelis. Jim, we could talk about this for a very long time, um, <laughs> but you fit Dundee. You're uh -huh. from Dundee. Uh, now, some people in, I remember one particular MP. Um, I think he saw himself as Spartacus because he walked into the Houses of Commons with a Palestine pin on his lapel. And I saw the Labour Council in, and many others who should know better in Glasgow and Edinburgh thinking that freedom for Palestine was uh, on the way when they flew a Palestinian flag for 24 hours during a brutal massacre. Mm. It was the most feeble act of solidarity imaginable. You guys up in Dundee, you've got a Palestinian flag flying 24 hours every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year above the city chamber building. What's the link between the and Palestine? It seems to be a good one that others should learn from. The, the longest uh, running uh, twinning association in the world, uh, Mick, and we are uh, proud to celebrate the 40th anniversary of that twinning arrangement this year of which the Fire Brigade Union will be fully involved. Uh, we've had a lot of difficult times and tough news to take over the last uh, while, as you know, through uh, different reasons and, and the, the election and supposed democracies of various racist leaders. Uh, these things have been happening and, and uh, obviously Palestinian issues have been pushed way, way back on the agenda. Uh, so the good news we got on New Year's Day was we're, we're going to be hosting uh, more firefighters here from Nablus. Uh, uh, hopefully in May, we're going to bring four firefighters over and uh, we'll hopefully have them crewing fire appliances here in the city. And that'll be the first time ever in the world, you know, that we've done that. But the I've line... I've been Nablus a few times, Jim, but I never yep. quite tried to be a professional Scotsman and freeload 
But I'm told that if I go to the Nablus fire station, I can get a free hummus um, if I say I'm from Scotland and <laughs> I know people in the FBU. Yeah. Is that story true? It is. We've got, they've got a Dundee fire engine there. Uh, there, there was a, a, a great uh, project that we, we, we had in 2011 where the Fire Brigade Union delegates uh, from throughout the UK uh, in May of that year uh, that you know that that trade good trade unionists keep their expenses, you know, and uh, they didn't go to the pub with them that time. We were in Southport, and they actually donated expenses and they raised money from their the regions, and we actually got enough money to buy a couple of fire engines uh, that were away to be taken out of service here in Tayside in Dundee area, mm. and uh, the fire brigade union bought those fire appliances with the money that was raised by all members from all regions. And uh, we kitted and equipped them through support uh, Operation Florian and other other uh, assistant groups. And uh, we drove them. Myself and another four or five comrades uh, shared the driving of these vehicles all the way to Greece, where one we lost one of these vehicles. But we had enough room on the other appliance, and we, we packed the kit and equipment on the other appliance, sailed from... from uh, from Greece uh, to the large sail from Greece over to Haifa, where the, the Israelis, as expected, stole the appliance of us and all the kit and equipment. Uh, and, uh, but we'd, we'd uh, sort of assumed that there would be issues. And uh, we, we met many people when we were over in, in Palestine for the, for the, the week after that, uh, and Israel. And we, met, uh, we made friends with many people in Israel and Palestine who wanted to help us. And uh, we came back, met politicians, and we managed to pressurise through those political contacts uh, the freeing of that appliance. And to this day, that appliance serves the people in Nablus with on the side, Dundee to Nablus, FBU. So uh, it's got a Scottish flag on it, and it's, uh, it's great. It's a great, uh, it's a great achievement, and it's uh, well, well noted that the kit and equipment that's used by these firefighters was also donated by the Fire Brigade Union through delivering uh, containers, shiploads of containers from Edinburgh uh, through to, again, Haifa, where again it gets impounded and you go through all the negotiations and diplomatic uh, pressure, press the pressure points, and uh, we have been successful now. Well, you have to navigate the treacherous do. rapids, don't they you? Do. But tell us more about this photograph, Jim. Right, uh, the, this is uh, uh, the firefighters in front of that fire appliance that is still used with uh, kit and equipment that was delivered in 2011. Uh, the lad with the white helmet on there is a great lad called Rabbi Antar, and Rabbi is a, a fa famous uh, Nablus firefighter who was shot by the Israelis at a checkpoint. Uh, he got a bullet that the size of your, the holes the size of your fist through his shoulder. Uh, but Rabi uh, and other firefighters there are wearing the Bristol kit that we took over in 2011 uh, with uh, the, the, the old fire helmets, the Cromwell fire helmets. But they've all now got brand new kit. You know, when I say brand new kit, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a PBI gold type kit. But they've got new boots and they've got new helmets and they've got some new cutting gear. And hopefully this year, later this year, we're going to be able to put together the, the fundraising uh, energy to get them another fire appliance. Absolutely wonderful. Saving lives, humanitarian work, and your friend, your comrade was shot. What's, what's, what's always shocked me, Jim, going to Palestine when I was able to go, um, was how casually you would speak to a taxi driver or somebody you met who was very friendly and so on, but you'd have to kind of tease it out of them. They would never dream of telling you that they had done five years in prison, yeah. or in some cases, 20 years in prison, yeah. Yeah. or multiple detentions yeah. without trial. That, yeah. that firefighters are, I'm sure, not exempt from that. In fact, they must incur more risk than the average. Many, many, of, the, right? yeah, many of the firefighters have spent time. I mean, I think it's the, you know, the, what, what I see this weekend in, uh, in England, the FA Cup's on, you know, whether if you're a football man or not, Mick, the FA Cup's on. And all the games are starting a minute late because they want to raise awareness of mental health. And the issue that I've uh, became very aware of when we speak to Palestinian ma males, you know, males and, and young males, is the, the mental health issue. 
uh, they're the only thing I can liken it, and I have known a few people that have been uh, uh, guests at Her, Her Majesty's uh, uh, hotels, that they're suffering from the same sort of stress. They, they seem to be, uh, as a, a stress, and a, 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 they're, they're never relaxed. You can't really get, get them relaxed. You know, they're, they're under stress, as, a, as a, I would say, somebody who has been in, in, in prison. And they are a, a highly, uh, a highly volatile uh, group uh, in in many ways when discussing their own uh, issues. Well, very calm, well, uh, doing their job. But when you get them away from uh, their job and you actually sit with them and you have a cup of tea or coffee and you're uh, and they're not in uniform, they're a very very agitated uh, group. And uh, well, that's not them all, obviously, but. Firefighters most certainly are. Uh, I think the film that, that we made back in 2015, uh, Kieran Gibbons. Film, Jim, and, and talk about the film and how other yeah. people might be able to arrange yeah. a showing of that film. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, the film is called Firefighters Under Occupation. Uh, the director is a great Welsh ep you member called Kieran Gibbons. Kieran came up to Scotland in 2014 uh, to film a training session that we had, a uh, training uh, project that was going on. Uh, in, in Scotland at Cambus Lang uh, and Kieran made a, a great great bit of film but he was so impressed he, he asked if he could come over to Palestine uh, I was planning on going uh, the fo- that later that year and he came with me and he made this film and it's been updated it was uh, of course uh, premiered in Dundee uh, in 2000, August 2016 and it since has been shown around the world it has won a silver medal at uh, the uh, Respect uh, Film Festival in Belfast. It uh, has been shown as far in the Western world as this, this October. Sorry, October past, Kieran and I went to Rochester, New York. We also went to uh, New Jersey. And, and the film is shown at the Palestinian American Community Center uh, in Clifton, New Jersey, which was a fantastic resource a wonderful place called R- Little Ramallah, they call it. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, but it's also been shown as far east as Tehran. Now, what does that tell you where we are in the world? That was shown in Tehran. How long, how long does the film last? And will you post a link for people to contact? Well, I will do that, Mick. Uh, you can actually just go on YouTube and get the... If you go on YouTube and put in Firefighters Under Occupation, or those of you who do Facebook can also find it under... Firefighters under occupation. Uh, I'll and post a link a, at the end for sure. Yeah, and you'll, you'll you'll get a link. You'll get a link uh, through uh, through Kieran, and Kieran will arrange the showing. That's been shown up and down this country. It's been shown in the three uh, parliaments or assemblies. Uh, it's been shown in the Scottish Parliament, Westminster. It's been shown in the Welsh Assembly. It's been shown uh, all over all over the UK. Uh, many many places you, you wouldn't have thought there had been. A great Palestinian support community, and you've you've it's been in the west of England. It's been shown twice down in the southwest at the Palestinian, the brilliant Palestinian Museum in Bristol, uh, the only museum as I, I know of in the UK, a uh, Palestinian museum. Uh, we've had some great uh, great experiences showing the film, and as I say, uh, the beautiful town last year in Otley in in Yorkshire, uh, which was superb. <laughs> we a beautiful wee uh, idyllic uh, uh, village, but and the place was packed. It was yeah. just wonderful. So this this year, the the film has been shown as I say. Oh, sorry, uh, last year at the end of the year, we took it to the states for the first time, and I thought that the the reception we received from uh, the organisers were mostly members of the Jewish Voice for Peace uh, uh, in Rochester and uh, in New York State, and it was an outstandingly successful visit. So, so it went down well. How long does a film last? Uh, current, yeah, how many minutes? Yeah, the current version lasts 75 minutes, Matt. Okay, okay. And we'll make it uh, not difficult for people to get in touch with. Uh, Jim, you're another bloody anti-Semite here, uh, along with Jeremy Corbyn, along with uh, myself, along with uh, almost anybody who's worth talking to. You stood recently as a candidate uh, for Labour in the Dundee election for, for Parliament, and I... I've seen many allegations of anti-Semitism, 
which are flimsy, I've seen others which are fabricated, I've seen others which are ridiculous, including against myself and other companies. But uh, the one against you, I think, broke new ground because I believe all you did was talk about your father and his experiences, and that was deemed to be anti-Semitic. Can you tell viewers, Jim, because I think it's really, really dramatic. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, I think it was a YouTube, uh, and it was a meeting that I'd, I'd spoken at after one of the, uh, in fact, I think it was after the Rachel Corey incident back in 2010. And it was a quite raw event for, for all those of us who supported uh, Palestine in the sense that we had tried to do something practical. Once again, firefighters had, had given kit and equipment, donated kit and equipment, and we got that onto the Rachel Corey. And uh, the kit and equipment was obviously uh, taken uh, from uh, the Rachel Corey by uh, the Israelis when uh, they stopped the Rachel Corey. And, uh, obviously, all the efforts that we'd made that were, 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 were obviously left in tatters, as they say. Uh, we did successfully send other kit with uh, George Galloway's. Uh, we managed to get kit and equipment through to Gaza. But this other kit and equipment, uh, as I say, and they the, the, the used this piece of uh, this, this footage in YouTube, which has always been there for people to see for, as I say, the past nine years, ten years, it's not anything that I'm ashamed of. And in fact, it's something that I'm quite proud that I spoke about. My father, well, you should be. So my you father's should. Uh, uh, served in Northwest Europe. Uh, he landed D Day plus one. Uh, he lost his own father, my granddad, who was also called Jim Malone. Uh, he was lying in Tel El Kabir in, e in Egypt. He was killed in September 1941. His oldest son immediately. Well, the next year joined up, signed up, but he was a regular soldier, my father. Although he served with the Highland Division, which was mostly uh, people that had conscripted in, uh, but various other uh, soldiers, no doubt, he came up. And, and like many young guys, uh, 19 years old uh, in Northwest Europe, he, he was three times wounded. Uh, he served until the end of the war, moving from the Black Watch to the, the Seaforth Highlanders to the and ending in 1945, in May 1945, with the Gordon Highlanders. So he got his cell around through various scrapes and scraps. His younger brother, John, my uncle John, who was only 10 months younger than him, also served. But my uncle John had poor eyesight, and he served with the Royal Army Service Corps, which my dad did after the demobilization of most of the forces of the British Army of the Rhine. Now, during his time in Northwest Europe, he witnessed many, many horrors, uh, and he relayed them to us very, uh, very occasionally. He didn't like many old soldiers. Didn't speak, although he served in, in the territorials up until 1975, and then he, he, to the day he died, he worked with cadets. He was a cadet instructor, again in Dundee, uh, very much associated with the Black Watch as a regiment. Uh, but his, his, his tales were what I relayed was that he saw the horrors at the end of the war. But after the war, uh, you know, after the horrors that were inflicted on European Jews in, in, in the Holocaust, uh, and all the diaspora people that were wandering Europe and he, he came across, and the horrors that these people, he, he recognised, and he was in the south of France and all that. Uh, he, he was in the south of France and he was helping the mobbed soldiers come home. So what he would do is, is he, because he was in the RSC by this time, the Royal Army Service Corps, because all the regiments, obviously, most of them were, were demobbed at the end of the war, but he had to serve until 1948. And he had witnessed many things. And on one of his, uh, the, he, uh, I take it, working at the, on the, the, the docks, helping these soldiers come back from service, he, he saw uh, both uh, Jewish people try to get to the, the, the Holy Land, to Palestine, from the south of France, which I believe happened many, many times. And uh, sometimes they were turned back, I believe, and sometimes they were actually sent back to Northwest Europe to actually be placed in the same camps that many of the people had already been, which, which is beyond belief and inflicted on them by the British, uh, British forces at the time. But you'd also uh, witnessed the soldiers coming back from Palestine, and they, they relayed to him the horrors that were inflicted on the British uh, soldiers by uh, the terrorist organizations working uh, uh, in Palestine at the time. And they were the, the, the terrorist organizations, uh, would be the STEM 
and uh, would it be the Hagana? Uh, and the, so you mean the three of them, the Hagana, the official uh, yeah, one, the yeah. Ergun, yeah. whose leader later became Prime Minister Menachem yeah. Begin, Begin, and the yeah. Stern Gang, whose leader yeah. Shamir Was, became Prime Minister. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and he relayed these things to us and saying, in, in the same sense, that horrors are not limited to one people. And he'd witnessed horror inflicted on many peoples, including his own, of course, you know, his own fellow soldiers. Uh, he thought he was cleansing, obviously, many, many pe people from, from the horrors of Nazism and fascism. And that it cost his own family and my family very, very severely in losing his dad. Uh, uh, and... He'd, he'd witnessed many, many things, including the, the, the release of prisoners from work camps and uh, people that had been in uh, concentration camps. And he'd saw all these different things and, the, as I say, the, the flotsam and jetsam of humanity that was moving about the world at the end of the Second World War. War. My dad was on docksides as these people were looking to find new homes. And but I believe, he, he, Jim, I believe the accusation against you uh, was... Yeah. At it, was because when you spoke to a large demonstration in the same delivery, the same speech, yeah. you spoke about your father and his experience of survivors of the yeah. Nazi Holocaust, and yeah. you also spoke about yeah. his experience of yeah. people Palestinians suffering under the mandate oh. and under Jewish yeah. terrorism, as it was known at that time, from the Irgun Stern and Haganah. Is that right? Yeah, I think he was probably, I mean, on in, in, in some reflection, he, and uh, isn't something that uh, uh, we we'll speak about much as a family, uh, other than my dad's, my dad's been dead a lot of years now, uh, and he died quite a young man, but when we, when we do speak about him, we do reflect on his humanity and his, his trade unionism. He was a strong, strong trade unionist as well that worked in manufacturing in the city, here in Dundee in a factory. And his, his uh, perspective of humanity, I hope that I share that, is that, you know, when people's, when people's or a people are under, under that sort of uh, uh, inhumane and barbarous treatment, it's our duty as the way we've been brought up, certainly, to stand up for those people. And I would never shirk away from what my, what my father said, is that he saw the horrors previously inflicted on one people attempted to be inflicted on another. And he, he, wasn't, he wasn't one for pointing fingers. He wasn't one for, he didn't have a great uh, love of German people to the day he died, but he, he actually did in, in the end sort of come around to meeting a German lad when he was on holiday in Yugoslavia, so, another Wehrmacht soldier that he eventually sort of made his peace with him. But he, uh, he was only sort of German that I remember him speaking highly of. So he, he, he had been scarred. The family had been scarred, but there's certainly no, in no way anything that he had in his mind that he was anti-Semitic in any way. He didn't have any hatred or, or feelings of that nature towards uh, Jewish people. He had saw Jewish people of many nations have a, a horror upon horror inflicted on them in, in Europe and the people that had uh, been displaced and placed in camps and work camps and and uh, as I say, extermination camps. So what he'd, he was relaying to me was uh, uh, all peoples uh, are, are capable of inflicting monstrosities on one another. And uh, it's for good people to stand up to that, you know. It's for good people that see, see wrong and are able to distinguish between wrong and right. And very much where we find ourselves, I believe, now, Mick, as a movement, as a trade union and labour movement, and the accusations made against me uh, during the election campaign, to me, are, 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 are you know, they're, they're slightly horrific as well as false, because what they do is we see a, a rise in these, uh, you know, right-wing uh, and nasty uh, racist leaders in, in the Western world. Uh, and what we do is we dilute the very anti-Semitism, the actual anti-Semitism and racism and Islamophobia that is occurring by making accusations against people without foundation, but to deny them uh, uh, the oxygen that they are providing these despots that we have run in our country. And that is, the, that is a real worry to me, the where we are is possibly, you know, getting back to times that we, th we hoped we would never see again back in the 30s, you know, uh, and we've got to be, be so uh, resolute and vigilant and we've got, we, we can't be, be, be quietened 
We've got to make sure that this programme, the message from it, keeps getting uh, 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 regenerated and keeps going out that people aren't giving up on Palestine. People are going to stand up for communities that are under attack wherever, whether in our country or whether in, in, in the Middle East. We've got to be seen to be vigilant, but we've got to be seen to be taking that peaceful message. Uh, yeah, but why uh, couldn't you? Why couldn't you just apologise for uh, having done something that you hadn't done? I mean, some people now have been apologising for their anti-Semitism, and when you look at the record, there was none. So why couldn't you just do that? Why did you fight back, Jim? It's. Uh, I'm not saying it's in. Uh, it's particular to my DNA or anybody else's. But I'm a trade unionist, Mick, first and foremost. And uh, I'm afraid the, the trade union people that spoke, uh, that taught me, the people that I sat with, the people that gave me my instruction as a trade unionist. And that that was ingrained in me by my mother who worked in a, a Dundee factory, my father who worked in a Dundee factory, would be disgusted to think that I would be saying sorry for something that there was nothing to say sorry for. I'm sorry, they're, uh, they're, they're not getting a, an apology for something that uh, wasn't need to be apologised for. I'll stand up for the, the values of Ken Cameron. I'll f stand up for the values of Ken was, uh, Mick Ken was popular and, yeah, oh, yeah. Fighter, yeah. yeah Ken, Ken was the, the first trade unionist uh, who, who... He was General Secretary of the UK FBU, was he not? He, he was, and, he, you know, he, he's, his history was so, so profoundly... Uh, uh, based on uh, humanity and, and what it is to be a socialist. You know, he, he, he recognised that, that Palestinians were being uh, treated abominably. And he, he discussed this with a young Dundee uh, Labour secretary called George Galloway, <laughs> and uh, along yeah. with a Labour MP called Ernie Ross, who had formed uh, 41 years ago, they formed the trade union Friends of Palestine. Now, this was the very first group in 1979. Now, in 1982, when the Israelis launched their ill-fated invasion of, uh, of Lebanon, and the, the barbarity that, that uh, ensued, and obviously the, 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 the shocking massacres in the refugee camps of Basra and Shatia, uh, at the TUC annual conference, Ken Cameron was the first trade unionist to put forward the motion. Now, that motion, I know because I've spoken to both gentlemen, was written in the whole by George. Now, George wrote that, expecting to face real problems because this was the first time a motion had been moved at the TUC explicitly criticising, one, the Israeli state, but also asking and calling for a Palestinian state. The first time, this is in 1982, and Ken moved that. Not only did he move it against the General Council, run by a great friend of Israel called Tom Jackson, if you remember. Oof, my yeah. God, you yeah. need a shower after you even say that name. Sorry, but he, it has to be said. And yeah, yeah. It was, he, he, the pressure that was placed upon Ken to, to withdraw, uh, well, it didn't matter. Ken moved it and it was overwhelmingly backed. And to the degree that, Ken, that uh, thankfully, Jackson, uh, uh, his time was up and he left. Uh, he was a, the general, and he had to, to leave his chairmanship. Uh, and uh, it was a, a great uh, event in the sense that it raised the profile of uh, the trade union movement and its opposition to the colonialism that was being issued by Begin's government. And uh, it obviously uh, raised the critical dialogue that we now have with the Israeli history group. Uh, yep. and, and the Israeli history group was placed on a uh, warning that no longer would the Trade Union Congress of uh, uh, the UK, and particularly the STUC led on this, that they were not going to be uh, getting an easy sounding. That yep. from now on, no, Palestinian by, rights... By the way, tri yeah. tribute, to, tribute to... Sorry to interrupt you, Jim. Tribute to George Galloway. I mean, when he's good, he's very, very good. And he did push the issue of Palestine to get away Ernie Ross and Ken Cameron before anybody else did. To be honest with you, now... Popular opinion has already swung massively against what Israel's doing, but in those days it was not so easy. Mm. So, uh, George cut his political teeth in Dundee, did he not? He did. He's a he's a, a son-in-law. He, as he likes to call himself, uh, you know, he's a son of Tipperary, and uh, it was that area I based my my campaign in uh, during the last election. And George has spoken to him fondly, uh, but uh, also with a, a good degree of fun as well. You know, he's uh, still got Rula Lenska lying uh, uh, in his uh, cupboard, you know. 
and right. on the whole, a son of Lochie, and, and and he's he's held in still held in high regard. Yeah. Um. So we are where we are, Jim. We've got the slug as our prime minister, who lies, degenerate, very much a mini a mini Trump. He's kept quiet during the assassination of. Uh, of Suleiman, the, the bombing of Baghdad. He's in Mustique Island, I believe. Mm. Uh, so he, they intend to, to move very much in support of Israel and against people who are going to support freedom for the people of Palestine. Dark days. The lights may not be going out over Europe, but they're getting a bit dimmer. Um, and we've got our own problems here. What's, what's, your, what's your advice to, to people viewing? It's fight or flight time, is it not? Oh, definitely, it's a fight time. This is uh, these are these times of, uh, of un unfortunately in my lifetime visited us before. Uh, we've had moments of uh, real despair, uh, obviously economically and uh, uh, what would you say politically. Nineteen seventy nine, uh, obviously, is a is a you know it's a it's a horrible date now in in our memory. Uh, uh, the few years previously, when working people never had more power. And we denied ourselves by uh, electing Thatcher and our, our, our obviously our politics of uh, of uh, division and uh, decay, industrial decay inflicted on us. Uh, what we're gonna what we're gonna have to do is look back on how we fought back in those times, uh, and not using obviously the means that we do it are, are varied and multiple. But we've got to stand united in solidarity as a trade as trade unionists. And what we do, what we do is we we'll always do. We we'll go. Most Scots will go back to work tomorrow, and uh, the first opportunity in the workplace, uh, a branch meeting you have, is you roll your sleeves up and you speak out on behalf of those that are oppressed. And remember that uh, we've got uh, such a division in our society. Uh, I'll go back to that election campaign. I saw deprivation in the area that George came from that I haven't saw for a long, long time. And I was a firefighter. And we used to go and uh, we saw people at their worst and some properties in some terrible shape. But we're seeing whole multi-story blocks afflicted. We've got deaths in Dundee now uh, running more than one a week of drugs. And as I, as I said, ten, in 10 years, we've lost over 500 young people in this city. So to drugs, and we've that's like a jumbo jet and more. We've got we've got to stand up to these issues, but we can only do it through internationalism, because internationalism is the the glue that holds trade unionists together. And by in any way forgetting what's being visited on the people of Palestine would be to deny their rights at the same time as forgetting the rights of those council tenants living in, de in deprivation. So we've got to fight as one. We've got to remember it as one. And this year in Dundee, we've got an opportunity to the celebrations arranged by the Twinning Association, by making sure we attend them as trade unionists, support them as well as we can financially. I know the FBU have done so, uh, that we will support the events in Dundee, bring the ambassador, Hussam Zomla, up, hopefully bring the new leader of the Labour Party, whoever he or she may be, and, and, met, and get them to engage in what Dundee people have always been engaged in, and supporting the Palestinian people, and continuing to support them for another 40 years and belong beyond. Well, our campaign exists to hold everybody's feet to the fire, to build on examples such as the folk in Dundee who've been doing sterling work for a very long time, and against those people like uh, Tony, Tony Blair and various oh. other people, there's elements, similar elements in the SNP, and we need to hold all their feet to the fire to say that if you don't stand up justice beyond the borders of your nation, then we don't trust you to stand up for justice here either. It's not an add-on. It's not a luxury internationalism. If you mean terrible harm to the people of Gaza, I think you mean harm to us as well. Do, do we not? Do they not? Yeah, absolutely. At the core, as I say, the, the core of your beliefs is a... And, a, 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 and our visit to Rochester... Uh, we spoke at their film festival, their Witness Palestine film festival. Rochester, and New York, in the USA. Rochester, Ro Rochester, New York State, uh, right on the Canadian border. And a uh, beautiful wee city, uh, uh, not unlike Dundee, uh, a beautiful wee city. And the, this Witness Rochester film festival, uh, I got a, a, a spontaneous stand innovation when I mentioned 
internationalism. I, I couldn't believe it. I've had, I've had claps and I've had applause uh, and there was a Q&A and the question, the question was your trade unionism, you know. Uh, and I'm very sorry, we appear to be cut off, mate. No, no, you're not. Carry on. And, uh, there's, there's some sort of advert or something anyway. But, oh, sorry about that. But no, no, you're coming over loud and clear, Jim. Oh, great. Continue. No, and it was just to say, you know, that... Uh, they, they are so unused to trade unionists speaking about internationalism in America. They actually stood and applauded and gave me a, 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 an actual stand innovation. And it was wonderful, but spontaneous. And it was also a little bit worrying, you know. Uh, it was a little, a little worrying to see that, that they, would, they would clap something uh, that was, uh, you know, really uh, what we would say is uh, bread and butter, you know. No, don't underestimate the people of the USA. Oh, no. I cut, I cut my eye teeth on opposition to the war in Vietnam. Yeah. And no, uh, we yeah. saw what Americans could do. Students died. People, black and white, fought like hell against Absolutely. that war and rendered real service to the injured yeah. people of Vietnam. Absolutely. And that, that, for me, Jim, I have, to, I have to be honest, a lot of people talk about South Africa and it's very, very, very important, especially for trade unionists. But for me, the model of solidarity, I think Vietnam's a better example because that was people around the world. They couldn't prevent the death of millions of people. We didn't have the strength mm. to do that, but we were able to hasten the end of that war. And we don't know by how much, but we were able to reduce the, the already high cost to the Vietnamese of, of securing independence. And I think our duty to the Palestinians is to do something similar. What do you think? Yeah. Uh... I was trying to support uh, also in Rochester. They have been trying uh, through various organisations. They've got a, a, a really uh, strong peace movement in Rochester. Uh, there's a huge university campus there, massive. And uh, many, many of the faculties there are involved in peace organisations. And a lot of them through the Christian Association. So I spoke at the Episcopal Church and I uh, visited, uh, as I say, the Jewish Voice for Peace, who really hosted us and they are uh, hoping this year to promote a twinning arrangement with uh, the Palestinian city of Hebron, Al-Khalil. So I was able to give them no other than uh, advice and support, but that uh, offer of advice and support was greatly received. And uh, as you say, America is, a, a, I mean, in no way was a, a suggesting that they are anything other than uh, uh, supporters. They the surprise for me was that, that at meetings they don't speak enough about internationalism through their trade union movement. And uh, as I say, that is at the core of what we are as trade unionists, is that we always make sure that we're internationalism and we're international committees are properly funded and supported within our own trade unions to do the, what trade unions should be about. So supporting one another throughout the world, improving the rights of workers wherever you are. I mean, just a final point, for me anyway, on that, Jim, before I ask you to make some concluding remarks. I mean, we've got Johnson as the Prime Minister, uh, the Bullingdon boy, a man who's a notorious liar. The only, I wonder if Jeremy Corbyn had been fired from a job for dishonesty. I think we would all have heard about it. Yeah. Well, Johnson did. But he's yeah. also got, the, our Home Secretary is the wonderful, uh, um, what's her name again? Pretty um, Patel. Ah, Pretty Patel. I was getting them mixed up actually with, with an Israeli, but anyway, <laughs> Pretty Patel. No. Pretty Patel's fired by Theresa May a couple of years ago because yeah. she goes to Israel. She meets with yeah. soldiers. She meets with officers and politicians. She comes. She doesn't tell the boss. So it's secret meetings. Politicians are excluded. She's got these dirty secret meetings, which you're never supposed to do. Breaches mm. all the protocols, mm. and um, and she comes back and asks the British UK humanitarian aid resources which of course you would be trying to tap into we all should yeah uh, but she wants to direct that to the israeli army at a mm -hmm. time when it's massacring journalists children disabled people i mean it's the depths of depravity that uh, if you put it if you put it in a cheap novel nobody would have people would have thought you were sort of over egging it would they not patel uh, as a as a curious uh, case uh, uh, i mean she's She's also very, very close to the Modi regime in India. Yep. Now, 
we all know that around the time that she was uh, losing her job and making headlines for the the holiday in Israel, uh, meeting Netanyahu and others uh, in his government. But she, her closeness with Modi uh, and uh, the resulting uh, uh, overtures, overtures made in relation to arms sales um, led me to believe, uh, just as a, you know, a, an innocent viewer with interest in such issues, well, what was she doing there? What was she really doing there? Because within weeks, they'd signed the biggest trade, arms trade deal between India and any other country out with uh, ourselves, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, she is a member, of, uh, a UK member of Modi's party. She is a facilitator for Modi within the UK. And at the same time, she's got herself closely entwined with the Israeli establishment. Uh, so I, I had more questions. I think she got it before more questions were asked. And uh, she's a, she's a, I mean, she's a human being, and we shouldn't see, speak too badly uh, hu of fellow human beings, but she is one that I could quite easily uh, uh, speak badly of. Let's end on a high note. Um, I'll be interviewing shortly, uh, not today, but, you know, in the next few weeks, um, somebody from India, because I think the good news is Modi behaved like a Netanyahu clone, although 20 times bigger. And he moved against uh, Muslims, nearly 200 million Muslims in India. Yeah, he and he is. seems to have provoked a storm of opposition, not just from Muslims, young students, the, yeah. the huge left that exists in India, yeah. which hasn't been uh, intimidated. Um, mm. And he seems to have got his fingers burned badly. And it's just the Israeli playbook. It's an ah. attempt to take a, a, sec a, a commitment to secular uh, politics and Hindu, you know, give privileges to Hindus and demean Muslims, and that's it, obviously what's happening in in in, yeah. in Israel as well. Privileges to Jews and demeaning Muslims and Christians there. So, can we take any hope from that, Jim? I hope you've been following the events in India. They're absolutely stunningly good. Yeah, India. he's he's been losing uh, provinces after of the provinces and local elections, which is fantastic. I thought there would have been more uh, more of an issue with the Kashmir. Uh, 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 issues, uh, seeing that he's still denying the people of Kashmir their, their full rights and trying to impose, uh, as you say, these diktats on them that are denying them contact with the outside world. Uh, however, it would appear the rest of India have decided to take up uh, the fight for on behalf of the Kashmiri people. So that's good. Uh, yeah, these are encouraging, encouraging uh, events, and we need more of these to to to, to give us some fuel for our, the fire that burns in all our bellies, uh, those that are progressive, those that, that want to see, uh, you know, the, the, the rights of, of all peoples respected, wherever there are in the world, and the, the horrible hate and, and violence that we're seeing visited on the people in Iran or Iraq, uh, again, uh, through that catastrophic uh, decision to invade back in 2003, uh, supported, obviously, by... Uh, Israel, uh, and uh, that the result has been uh, millions of deaths and uh, deprivation inflicted on uh, people's. We, as I say, as progressive with a voice, uh, can't can't be uh, cowed. Uh, we've got to keep speaking, and we've got to keep working and being active. We've got our trades council here in Dundee on Wednesday. If you're watching this in Dundee and you're a trade unionist, speak to your trade union and come along because we've got. Uh, more problems to face this year and local authority cuts, no doubt. We'll have uh, the organisation of events uh, uh, in support of the Palestinian people through the twinning. And we've got, but no doubt about it, uh, you know, real, real struggles uh, in, in factories and workplaces throughout. So we've got to be up for it and we've got to be engaged, educated and ready uh, for what's coming. Because as you say, Mark, we've got some... Uh, really, really dodgy figures in charge of the Western world at the moment, and we've got to be there and ready and willing and able uh, to dispose of them because we do live in a democracy of sorts, and we've still got that right to vote, uh, and we're going to have to use that vote. Jim Malone, 37 years of firefighter, FBU member, and I think part of an initiative that's a gold standard for delivering effective solidarity to the hard-pressed people of Palestine. Friends, I want to thank Jim again for joining us. 
Um, and I'll have another interesting guest for you next Sunday at 4 p.m. So do join us then. This, rec this will be recorded and, and available very, very shortly after the termination of the, of the talk. Um, you might have noticed that uh, Donald Trump is behaving like a savage and a, and a, a deranged individual uh, taken out, bombed Baghdad airport to kill leading members of another government. And the only government in a world which has wholeheartedly, publicly and enthusiastically supported Trump is Israel. Even those people who might want to get close to the big bully in the playground are holding back a little bit, France, Germany, Britain, um, and so on. Um, so it's a very dangerous time indeed. We really have to come together in order to help to fight back. And that means whether you're for or against independence in Scotland, we have to fight back. All of those committed to justice for the people of Palestine and an end to aggressive wars which our government seems to be pursuing like a heroin addict, a habit that they just can't shake. So once again, a hearty thanks to Jim Malone for joining us. Jim, keep up the fantastic work. Uh, the picture behind you is a testimony to the kind of work that they do. Jim Malone, thanks again and goodbye viewers.